Hey guys, how are you? This is Dr. Kim. Thank you for tuning in again for another uh, interesting radiographic case that I have to share with you today. Here you're looking at a 12-year-old female patient, a panoramic radiograph. And if you would pay close attention to the anterior maxilla, I want you to see the location of the canines as well as the lateral incisor. Both of these canines are mesially tipped, that I mean the crowns are mesially tipped, pointing toward the lateral incisor. At least in, on the patient's right side, here you're looking at number seven, the seven is erupted. But if you look to the left, or the patient's left, I mean, <coughs> Um, it's abutting the lateral incisor, but the lateral incisor failed to erupt. So we have an impaction of number uh, 10, as well as uh, a parent impaction of uh, both of these canines, 6 and 11. Um, so when we have these impactions, uh, you want to ask your, you know, yourself a question, uh, where are the precise locations of these impacted teeth? Additionally, are there any resorption of the permanent lateral incisor? Doesn't appear to be that way here, but is there or is there not? Also here, assessing the uh, resorption of the lateral incisor can be definitely difficult. In addition to that, again, like how is this canine located relative to the lateral? Is this really directly on top of one another? Or is this canine perhaps buccal or lingual to the lateral incisor, but you know, we, uh, it appears to be they're right on top of one another. Additionally, let's look at the relationship between uh, central incisor and the lateral incisor, 9 and 10. They appear superimposed, right? They appear overlapped with one another. Once again, what is its precise spatial relationship between the two? Is there a resorption caused by either of the teeth? Or, again, is it causing displacement of the, any one of these teeth? Additionally, likewise, is the lateral in front of the central or behind the central? All of these questions cannot be readily obtained from this single radiographic image. Even if you take periapical radiograph, um, it can still be challenging, even though you apply slop technique accurately. It just doesn't give you a good anatomic information. Now here's a lateral ceph of that patient. <coughs> what you probably didn't see before is that this patient has an underbite or crossbite in the anterior maxilla. That was not easy to uh, appreciate. So again there's a benefit of taking this lateral ceph, right? Of, of course you'd have seen that clinically. But again as we try to um, focus this area. Let's see. We can see the central. Um, there's again superimposition of many structures that it looks like the canines are palatally inclined. But again, how much information you can get out of this, I'll leave it up to you. It's not easy. So this is where the Comim CT is so helpful in that regard. So you're looking at the Comim CT scan of that patient. Uh, this image again looks immediately very similar to panoramic radiograph that I uh, have shown you already, right? So let me bring it a little bit closer to the center. And let's look at this together. Well, why don't I go to the anterior portion of that scan? So we'll move all the way anteriorly and then move posteriorly. So you can see as I'm moving this, my green lines are also changing in other planes. So this is axial and that's sagittal. So you can see if you're not sure which coronal slide you're looking at, this is the section of the volume. Okay, so now I'm moving posteriorly. We're starting to capture the enamel layer of the central incisors right here. Okay, and then moving posteriorly. 
So here we have centrals. And we have lateral and canine. Let me go back one more time. Canine, lateral, and centrals. I think to make uh, this view a little bit more easier for you to interpret, I'm going to rotate something like this so that we're seeing the more anatom full length of the central incisors. And we can again see canine and laterals a little bit better. What's interesting here uh, is that I don't see any overt evidence of root resorption, but you can see the degree of root dilaceration, right, the bending. And you think it's probably related to this impaction and the way this tooth had been uh, forced to erupt as a result of this uh, canine, right? It, it mechanically makes sense that when the uh, force is directed in this, in this way, and then the lateral is um, forced to kind of come out in this way direction then you can have a dilaceration and same is true on the uh, left side as well this lateral incisor clearly has been shifted or displaced medially almost to the um, uh, intermaxillary suture as a matter of fact it actually engages the nasopalatine canal okay the root is extended into the nasopalatine canal you can see as this tooth is being displaced while it's trying to erupt into the occlusion, you can see that there is a dilaceration of the root. Quite a bit, as a matter of fact. So that's going to be important to note that, right? Uh, it might have been, might not have been very clear on panoramic radiograph, although I think you might have been able to see that just a little bit. But again, the precise extent and the severity of the dilaceration of these two laterals uh, could not have been easily detected. Oh well, let me actually go back. Yeah, I think it's hard to say, right? It's hard to say how much of that uh, dilaceration is present. Again, it's very difficult to visualize in this area. So again, how you can see how combing is so helpful. And this creates a uh, potential problem or a challenge for orthodontists. If you're having to move the tooth in, in such a direction, the dilaceration is going to kind of fight against that, uh, the rotational movement or the force that you have to apply. So here, here's that canine. Um, and now I'm going to manipulate the contrast to adjust this 3D rendering. So I think this is much easier for almost all of us to comprehend immediately right so let's look at uh, let's start out with the front view so two central lateral incisor and you can see the dilaceration as I shown before and here's the canine that's mesially tipped and also um, look at the amount of dilaceration we have on the central incisor you know as I was looking at this I was kind of curious as to why we have such a significant uh, dilaceration on these teeth. I mean, I don't see that these teeth were impacted uh, by any other, you know, adjacent teeth. Uh, I don't know for sure. Maybe these were shaped such way because of due to the eruption of the or impaction of the lateral incisor. <coughs> But if we look over to this side, uh, that's a pretty complex spatial relationship that you just are not going to get on lateral staff or panoramic radiograph. So what we have here is the lateral incisor that's been displaced or positioned lingual or parallel to tooth number nine. And that can be seen here, okay, in the axial view. So let's uh, identify these structures in the axial view now. To central incisors, primary lateral, permanent lateral, and as I go toward the apex, moving up, these are two permanent lateral incisors, right here. So this tooth is positioned here, and that lateral that's relatively horizontally positioned can be seen here. And along with that, 
the follicle of um, follicle of the uh, lateral and then the canine. Let me move more superiorly. Okay, so again central, lateral, and then we have canines. Alright, now why don't we look at this in the sagittal view. Okay, I'm gonna let me see if I can adjust a little bit so that you have a better appreciation of what you're seeing in the sagittal view. So this particular sagittal view corresponds to this red line that you're seeing. Okay. So that canine or this tooth is the canine here, and that crown is the crown of lateral incisor. So as I move toward the midline, you can see my red line is moving as well. So now here's tooth number eight, nasopalatin canal, lateral incisor number nine, canine, lateral, central. So it's looking, slicing right through this this plane, right here. So you're getting a little bit of central through the root of um, lateral and a little bit of that canine. So this information once again is extremely helpful for uh, our, our student and faculty if they are asked to now uh, expose these canines, right? So in order to do that, they have to know precise locations of these two canines, and most likely they're going to have to approach palatally, palatally and to measure the distance of where they want to create an opening from a landmark that they can uh, reliably measure. It could be from the incisal edge of the uh, central, or could be a CEJ of central and then measure the distance and they would create a window and um, uh, help expose the canine and place a, uh, a bracket in order to bring down the canine. So anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about it. Sorry it was a long video, but again, such an interesting case, the way how it has caused the uh, dilaceration of the adjacent lateral incisors. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. Oh, one thing that I didn't mention is whether there's a presence of overt root resorption. As you can see, the crown is definitely touching the lateral incisor in both cases, but I don't I see an overt, overt root resorption. Overall, outline of the root looks normal to me. Perhaps there's a minimal, but again, if when I'm saying overt, that means there's no gross significant root resorption, which is a good sign for the patient, right? Anyway, thank you again and take care.